At Precision Analytical, we feel like our hormone testing offers some distinct advantages to both the healthcare provider as well as the patient. So we often get asked, well, how does your testing compare to other methods, 24-hour urine testing, to blood testing, to saliva testing? And in this educational video, we're going to talk and compare our testing with saliva testing, which happens to be a test that I'm very well uh, familiar with, having managed the testing of well over a million saliva tests. And so we're going to uh, look at that just briefly. With saliva testing, you're really looking at some significant benefits and then really some some perceived benefits that we want to really look a little more closely at. In terms of actual benefits of saliva testing, the biggest benefit really is convenience and then for the adrenal testing that you can see the diurnal or the daily free cortisol pattern. So as we compare our testing to saliva testing, the convenience is still there. Uh, most people that we talk to that have done both tests really prefer ours just in terms of convenience, but saliva testing is an easy test. Uh, the dried urine testing, it's four simple dried urine uh, tests. It's also very easy. So there we're maintaining the easy collection. Uh, and then with the daily free cortisol uh, we really agree that this piece of information, how that free cortisol changes throughout the day, your stress hormone, is really important. And we wanted to preserve that, and that was really part of the motivating factor behind building the testing the way that we did, because it's really important. But we also take it a step further in a way that's really critical to getting the right answers to what's going on with particular patients, and that is that we also include cortisol metabolites for a fuller picture. So let me show you two examples to show you why this is important. So on the top, don't pay too much attention initially, but that really goes through the cortisol metabolism, and on the bottom is what you're used to seeing from saliva, which is the daily free cortisol pattern. So you can see the black notes the ranges. You can see the ranges of the, the three samples here as well as the overnight sample. So for saliva, you'd expect to see a morning sample. You'd also be adding in a sample around noontime. So we're trading that sample for an overnight measurement of cortisol. And we think that's a pretty good trade because you're really getting to see cortisol and what it looks like while you're trying to sleep. And since it's related to sleep issues, that's a nice thing to look at for your patients. Uh, but we really are getting similar patterns here as what you'd see in saliva. So for these two patients, you can see in the red you can see the patient's results for cortisol. They're on the lower side for both of these patients. So then what we do is we take the aggregate of those four measurements and we estimate the total amount of free cortisol throughout the day. So that's what this value here is, is a calculated value. So the range is between 11 and 31 and you can see this patient is low at 9 and this patient's a little bit lower at 7. So what are you concluding? You're concluding that this patient is not making a lot of cortisol. But you actually don't know that yet. You need to look at other information to understand that. So let's go back to the free cortisol and let's just look at the magnitude of the numbers. So in the morning you're getting your highest levels and you can see that up at the top we're around 100. So these total cortisol metabolites are in the same units and look how many we're getting. We're getting up in the reference range is 2400 to 4500. So there's a, most of the cortisol is actually represented as a cortisol metabolite by the time it finds its way into urine. And so in the patient on the right, you look at the cortisol and you see, okay, this person is deficient. When you look at the total cortisol metabolites, which is tetrahydrocortisone, tetrahydrocortisol, uh, both alpha and beta. So these big cortisol metabolites. And what you see is this person, it's confirmed. Yes, the adrenal gland does not make much cortisol because cortisol is low as well as the metabolites. When you look at the patient on the left, this is not true. Yes, this person has low levels of free bioavailable cortisol, but when you look at their metabolites, you can see here almost 6,000. So this person makes more cortisol than 95% of the population. Yet when you only look at the free cortisol, you would not be able to conclude that and you would treat these two patients the same. Whereas the person on the left needs their HPA axis calmed a bit because it's very overactive, the patient on the right, that's definitely not the same situation. So we want to be able to differentiate between these two situations 
and you can only do that while maintaining a look at the diurnal free cortisol pattern with this test. And so that's a major advantage. So you might be surprised to know that of the patients, if we just isolate these two values, of the patients that we test that have low free cortisol, more of them are in the top one-third for total cortisol metabolites than are deficient. So a significant portion of these people are not truly deficient in terms of their cortisol production. So this is something that we need to work through in terms of how you treat these patients differently, but we do know that we cannot treat them the same and expect good outcomes for all of these people because they present very differently. So that's a major advantage of the way we're doing our test relative to salivary testing, which is still a good way to test the diurnal free cortisol pattern, but we're just at, able to add in some really important information on top of that. So let's go over these last two, which are by my estimation, more perceived benefits of salivary testing. Now, we talked about free cortisol. There is a definite advantage to testing free cortisol as you see it in saliva relative to, say, a total cortisol measurement that you might measure in blood. So that is then often extrapolated to estrogens, progesterone, and testosterone in the sense of thinking that the salivary values are of more clinical significance because we're measuring quote-unquote free levels. And this can just go down as an opinion, but as an analytical chemist, after looking at lots of these different assays in saliva and some of the uh, difficulties in measuring those, it's a reasonable test, but there are a lot of challenges in getting those measurements. And by my estimation, any theoretical benefit of measuring the quote-unquote free hormone is more than undone by how difficult the analytical challenges are for testing these very low-level compounds. So the second perceived benefit, which we'll talk about um, at the end if you want to hang on for some more specific information, but is that when we give topical supplementation, so transdermal on the skin uh, creams in terms of progesterone and some of these hormones, you really only see the increase, uh, to the degree anyways, with saliva testing. And there's a profound message to be learned here about topical hormones, and we'll get into that in just a minute. But as you really dig through the data, you find it's really not a highly reliable monitoring tool for these situations. So when is saliva testing best? I think saliva testing is best for multipoint testing measurements for example, through a menstrual cycle. Right? So if you look at these examples uh, provided by Rocky Mountain Analytical, they do saliva testing and do it quite well. If you look at progesterone on the bottom, you can see throughout the cycle you have basically no progesterone. And then around day 14, ovulation happens and you start to make progesterone. So you can see that this patient finds themselves within, here's the reference range in these lighter blue, and you can really track that and see what's happening with those hormones throughout the month. And then on the top, you can see the estrogen. So you're going to get a little bit of a peak before ovulation, and then you're going to get a smaller uh, kind of plateau of estrogen throughout the luteal phase. And again, you can compare that to what's normal and see not only are there some aberrations, but when those are happening, and that can help drive some clinical decisions. And that's a really nice use for saliva testing because it's cost effective, it's easy to do day after day, and that's a good use for it. I think most other uses. It can be a reasonable tool, but the precision analytical test, I think, has a number of benefits uh, and advantages over salivary testing for both sex hormones and the adrenal hormones. The, the benefits of precision analytical testing being it's still convenient. You're getting your diurnal cortisol pattern, but you're getting more. The values are based on about 14 hours of time, all told, uh, as compared to more of a snapshot that you'd get with blood or saliva testing. And I think that's a real advantage to these hormones that ebb and flow throughout the day. In terms of methodology, and this is something as an analytical chemist, that I just have a lot more confidence in looking at the most accurate method possible, GC tandem mass spectrometry. That's how we measure estrogens, testosterone, their metabolites, those things, and then cortisol by LC, MS, MS. And those are really the gold standard methods in terms of accuracy. And then you're also able to look at not just your primary estrogens and androgens, estradiol, for example. You can also look at the metabolites, which also gives you more confidence in saying, you know, if a patient's estrogen deficient, you can see all of those metabolites, but it also shows you oftentimes why a patient might be elevated for estrogen if they have a metabolism issue or if they have a very disfavorable metabolism picture that you can address nutritionally. These are a lot of advantages to this test 
over uh, what you'd find with a salivary test. So if you'd like more information on our testing, feel free to reach out to us at info at precisionhormones.com or visit our website at precisionhormones.com. We really think you'll find that it's simply better testing and we look forward to working with you. If you'll hang with us for just a few minutes, we want to go and circle back around. For those of you who use topical hormones, this is really information that you need to have as you're making the most informed decisions you can for helping your patients. So with saliva testing, and topical hormones, saliva teaches us that some tissue get more hormone than what is reflected in our urine test or in serum testing when topical hormones are used. And that's a really legitimate uh, point that we need to take heed of. However, the values themselves are really highly variable. The levels will change dramatically with different application sites, with different bases, with some of these parameters, and some of which you can't really entirely control. And I want to show you a few of those. So here's an individual who's putting on topical testosterone. And you can see that as he puts the hormone closer to the saliva gland itself, you can see that the values are exponentially going up. So the value here by the collarbone is almost a hundred times higher than what's going on down here. Forearm, abdomen, buttocks, and foot. So you've got a relationship there between the values that you find and where you put it on relative to the saliva gland. So not only does it make it hard to use that then as a test, but it also shows us that the mechanism by which the hormones are getting into saliva is probably more complicated than we understand. It's not this simple model of free hormone diffusing into the saliva gland, and that's why it's a superior measurement. There's potentially some sort of diffusion of sorts, whether it's through the lymphatic or whether it's red blood cell transport or whatever it is, you know, that's something that's really not well understood. But what we do know is that those values can change exponentially depending on one variable here. So let's look at another situation where that variable, the, the site of application, is held constant and a different variable is changed. So here we have testosterone with one single person with different bases that the hormone is in. So you can see for one base, the values stay relatively low throughout the day, still definitely an increase, but nothing like what you see here in the blue. Now, why is that problematic? I mean, you could say, well, you know, potentially this base is getting you a lot more hormone, and maybe it is. But what you do know is when you're most likely to test saliva, is at 12 or most commonly at 24 hours. Now look at this patient's value at 24 hours. They're the same for both situations, yet the story that's gone on over this time is dramatically different. So then are those values meaningful? That's something that we really need to bring into question uh, in terms of it being a viable monitoring tool for actually changing the clinical decision. So if we want to look at a study where as many variables as possible were held constant. Here we have multiple women with the same dose of the same product put in the same location in a controlled environment. And what you can see is that there is a huge difference between one person and another. Now whether those changes are clinically significant or not, I think is something that we need to be discussing uh, and that's something that needs further exploration. If we look at these four people, you know, obviously one of these people has salivary values is huge. Now keep in mind, all four of these people would have urine values that don't change much at all, serum values that were shown to not change at all throughout the day. We look at another person here. You can see three people actually from the same study. So, you know, it's just really unpredictable that you get these waves of hormone, you know, early on, but then at the end, all three of these people end up pretty much in the same spot, even though they've taken three different journeys to get there. So are those values at 24 hours really telling us something that should change our clinical decision? That's an interesting question. Now here's uh, kind of all those people in one graph. And one thing to note is that the premenopausal range uh, is less than 200. Okay, so in the luteal phase, premenopausal women are not getting above about this line. 
Okay, so you can see every single person in this study got a wave of hormones. Sometimes it's a flat wave. Sometimes, uh, as seen in this person, it goes really high and then back down. In this person, it's really high all day. I mean, those are astronomical values. And again, none of these people see an increase in serum testing. So what does that mean in terms of the clinical significance, um, I think is a really good question. We know that the saliva gland is getting at some time flooded with hormone, uh, but does that really reflect what's going on systemically? I think to, to look at that question, we really need to look at some more clinical parameters. So let's switch to testosterone for a moment and look at that with testosterone. We've got a built-in mechanism for telling us when we have too much hormone. If a man takes excessive testosterone, his luteinizing hormone is going to go down, LH. If you take 100 milligrams of weekly injections, most men will see their LH, or at least some men will see it in, entirely suppressed. Okay, so let's look at testosterone in one situation. 50 milligram transdermal gel. Saliva goes up 15 fold. So a 15 times increase, not 15%, 15 fold increase in saliva, which tells you that's a lot of hormone. The serum or the urine, however, go up modestly. So then what happens to LH? These are hypogonadal men. So these are men that have testosterone deficiency, which means this baseline value is actually an excess of LH. Now, we said if these men were to take too much testosterone, what would happen is we'd go clear down to zero, and if we give them large injections, we would see that. With a 50 milligram dose, what we see is that they come down right into the reference range. And then the, the one below here is 100 milligrams, and I think this one's 25 milligrams. So what do we know? LH suppression implies a modest dose, agreeing more with serum or urine testing. Let's go one step further and look at muscle mass increase. In this study, they split everyone into two groups. So they're taking topical testosterone. The first group is the group that didn't have its serum values go up. Now keep in mind, the saliva values were probably very, very high for these people. Remember, on average, they go up about 1,500%. Okay? The people on the right were people who actually saw a serum increase. And when you look at a change in lean body mass, you don't see one in the group on the left, and you do see it in the group on the right. So unless the serum values are going up, you don't see it. So what does that mean? It's still a significant find in that saliva values go up because, again, it does tell us that some tissue are certainly getting more hormone than we think they are if we're looking at urine testing or at serum testing. However, it does not appear to be systemic, and so we need to use real caution when we're looking at that. Now, this last bit of data I'm going to show you just to make the point that this issue with topical hormones and how we get huge saliva values and we don't see increase as much in urine and serum is really still a bit of a mystery. So if we're going back to this progesterone data. So throughout the cycle, a woman is, again, relatively deficient for progesterone. Then she ovulates and up comes progesterone. It'll come up in blood. It'll come up in urine. It'll come up in saliva. And again, saliva is a good tool for tracking that. Now, if this woman throughout her follicular cycle, took no progesterone, and then in the luteal phase, she took topical progesterone, you wouldn't expect her to go up into that reference range. You'd expect her to go up into this supraphysiological range that we see, for whatever reason, with, with salivary testing. And you can see these numbers are huge. But this woman's not on topical hormone. She actually stopped the topical hormone before this menstrual cycle, came back down to baseline, and then during the luteal phase, a time in which she makes progesterone, she goes back up into this super physiological range. Again, serum values are going to be low, urine values are going to be low, but somewhere there's a progesterone depot that she's accessing or whatever, uh, and it's data that's hard to even believe, except that the uh, you know Rocky Mountain Analytical, who's looked at this in several cases, has shown this repeatedly in women who are formerly, not currently, but formerly on topical progesterone and have seen over months this mountain of progesterone come down. Now, what does that tell you? What it tells you is this thing about topical hormones, transdermal hormones, is really mysterious in terms of how the progesterone gets to where it's going without flooding also the urine 
and the serum, and it may well be that the saliva values are really reflecting more of a body burden of these fat-soluble hormones as we take them, and not as much the systemic uh, exposure. Uh, But what I think we can safely conclude is that it's really not an effective tool for monitoring in these situations, and I think any testing modality is challenging. In serum or in urine testing, you're going to get values that underrepresent what's going on in some tissue, at least the saliva gland being one of those. Um, and so we've really got to think our way through this. And I think if you're using serum and urine testing and you push your patients clear up into those young, healthy levels with that particular route of administration, you really run the risk of overdosing. But if you start to try to monitor your dosing and try to get yourself into some uh, particular range with saliva testing, there are just too many variables for that really to be an effective way to practice medicine. And so when is saliva testing best? Again, is really just multi-point measurements throughout the menstrual cycle is probably the best best use for it. And I think in most other cases, the testing that we're doing here at Precision Analytical is really a simply better way to do our testing. And again, if you're interested in more information uh, on our test, again, please email us at info at precisionhormones.com or visit our website.